Why do 19th century farmhouses creep people out? These types of houses have been used in horror movies for years, but they also hold tales of real life hauntings, like the Hinsdale House, the Sally House, and the Bell Witch Farm. Another reason might be because famous unsolved crimes have happened inside farmhouses. For instance, the Lizzie Borden case, the Hinder Kaifak murders in Germany, the murder at White House Farm in the UK, and the location I'm going to talk about tonight, the Velisca Axe Murder House, a murder that was so upsetting it left the small town of Velisca, Iowa shaken to its core. everyone and welcome back to Historically Haunted. I am your host Ariel and I hope that you all had a fun Halloween and Thanksgiving if you celebrate those holidays. Sorry that you got no episode last month. Um, I work retail and for those of you that have worked retail during the holidays, you know how crazy the hours can be. I also got promoted to sales lead manager and while that was great, I got more hours and then some people at my work got the flu and I had to change up my schedule and I got super overwhelmed last month, <laughs> mixed up appointments, felt like a failure at life and with this podcast, and then I blinked and it was December. I'm only telling you this because if you were also in your 30s and you feel overwhelmed, like you have no idea what you're doing with your life and you're still struggling to adult and make it all work, you are not alone because I had a tiny little crying breakdown last month, but things are back to normal now so I can catch up where I left off with this podcast. And like I said, I'm only telling you this because there is a light at the end of that tunnel if you ever feel like that you're not alone we all feel that way sometimes but I am so happy to be back today's episode will be a first for my channel I am interviewing a ghost hunting group out of Texas called misfit apparitions while they were inside the actual home that we will be talking about during this episode they were there doing a paranormal investigation and they were kind enough to reach out and ask if I wanted to interview them while they were inside the house. They also have started their own podcast called Misfit Apparitions, the podcast, along with a YouTube channel and their website is www.misfitapparitions.com. So please go give them a follow and check them out. I have a link to all of their pages down below in the show notes. Since this episode will have an interview attached to it, this is going to be the structure of the show. First, I'm going to do the history of the case and the surrounding area as usual, and then I will break in with the interview. And then after that, I will give you a brief summary of what the group experienced inside the house. Now, they will be doing a full episode coming out sometime in January where they will be talking about their investigation in depth Plus, they will discuss any video evidence or EVPs that they captured during their investigation. After the interview, I will wrap it all up with the ghost stories. The crew being inside the actual house during this interview was a really cool and kind of creepy experience at the same time. I will be posting the video of our interview on my YouTube channel and they will be doing the same as well. Also, a quick disclaimer that this episode is a true crime case and this one also sadly involves six children, including some findings that might be extra disturbing to some. It is a very sad case to talk about and I just wanted to warn you all now that if true crime and sad things happening to children is not your thing, then you might want to skip this episode. Before I start the show, I have many overdue thank yous to make to my newest Patreons. This list is extra long because over the last three episodes that I had posted for Halloween were pre-recorded and I did not include any of my new Patreons. So I would like to thank Lily, Myron, Patty, Nancy, Mimi, Lee, Lisa, Lexi, Jennifer, Robert, Grace, Melinda, Rena, Marilyn, Mandy, Gwen, Donna, Deborah, Bree and Nana, Kelly, Amy, Catherine, Angela, April, Reeves, Abigail, Christy, Sean, 
Haley, and Alexandra. Thank you all so much for signing up to support the show. It really means a lot to me. If anyone else is interested in helping me pay for things like hosting fees, music, and sound effects payments, you can by donating at least $1 to my show. Some people give me $1 or up to $3 a month, but other people just give me a buck and bounce. And either way, it all helps support the show. So thank you all so much. If anyone is interested, there's a link to my Patreon page down below in the show notes. I also wanted to thank anyone for the kind iTunes reviews and for those of you who have left reviews and stars on other podcasting apps. It really is a great free way to help support the show as well. I also really appreciate the kind comments and emails that I've received over the last few months. So thank you all so much for those. Another big announcement is that I now officially have a P.O. box. I'm trying really hard to turn this into a business and opening a official P.O. box was a good start. If you ever wanted to send me a card or a letter, you now can. If you wanted to send me something else, I do have some rules though. Please don't ever send me anything knowingly haunted like haunted objects or creepy dolls or spirit boards. And I will not be accepting any unsealed homemade food. If you would like to send me anything else that is not on that list of no's, uh, you can at Historically Haunted P.O. Box 1497, Conover, North Carolina, zip code 28613. And I will have it all typed down in the show notes down below. Okay, that is it for the announcements. Sorry that took so long, but um, that's what happens when I went so long with making pre-recorded episodes. I had to get all that information out to you guys. So now that I'm done, it's time to start the episode. In a small town in Iowa. What was that? Uh, anyway, before I was so rudely interrupted, um, like I was saying, in a small town in Iowa, in Villisca, <laughs> monsters. Wait, what are you doing here? Wait, are you trying to tell me something? Okay, well, what do you have to say? Oh, okay. Well, you didn't have to say it so rude, but I'll translate. According to our cryptid friends, I am long overdue for a monstrous moment. I am so happy to be back for my first monstrous moment since I have moved. And I hope that you guys missed this segment as much as I did. Today's monstrous moment is the tale of the Van Meter Visitor, also known as the Van Meter Monster. On a chilly fall evening in 1903, the small town of Van Meter, Iowa, was winding down for the day. It was nearing the end of September, and the town was getting ready to settle in for the coming winter months. A business owner named Eugene Griffith was driving home after a long night at the office. Griffith had lost track of time, and he was in a hurry to get home to apologize to his wife for being so late. Records do not say if he was driving an automobile or a horse and buggy, but it does claim that he was driving at a brisk pace. Along the way, his mind had already wandered to the amount of paperwork still waiting for him on his desk for the next day, when he turned down yet another street and casually glanced up toward the rooftops. He suddenly noticed a strange bright light above one of the buildings. He described it as being as bright as a searchlight, and it looked as if, somehow, it was hovering above the rooftop of a two-story business. This strange bright light made Griffith slow down to get a better look. First, he stated that he thought it was a possible break-in. Then he thought that maybe it was some young kids that were on top of the roof either trying to play a prank or messing around. As he stopped his vehicle to get a better look at it down the darkened street, he said that the light suddenly disappeared, and then just as suddenly reappeared on another rooftop on the other side of the street, but further down from the original building. Some versions of this story say that he saw the light shoot up into the sky and fly away, while others say that he simply lost sight of it 
and it disappeared. Losing sight of this strange light, he went home and told his wife all about it. The next day, he told people in town about what he had seen. Griffith was considered a respectable businessman, and he risked his reputation in town by telling this story, but he insisted that what he saw was a strange light on top of a roof, and it really creeped him out. He claimed that he just got an eerie feeling about what he had witnessed. Even though he told people about it and the word had spread throughout the about 1,000 town folk, not many people gave the story much thought as they went about their day. Reports of strange lights had already been gracing the front covers of newspapers for local and national news, but most people thought these were just made up articles or just straight up hoaxes. Later that night, the town's physician, Dr. Alcott, was sleeping behind his main office. Around 1 a.m., he claimed that he was woken up by a bright light that was shining into his window. Thinking it was burglars, he grabbed his shotgun and went to the window to see if he could see the perpetrators. What he saw made his blood run cold. There, behind his office, he claimed that he saw what he described as a half-human, half-monster. It was over eight feet tall, had giant black leathery bat-like wings and it was walking on the ground in a strange gait. Dr. Alcott noticed that the face of this creature looked like it had a horn on its forehead and it had a bright light that was coming from the notch of the horn between the creature's eyes. Terrified, Alcott swung open the door and fired his shotgun at the creature multiple times. The doctor either missed or the bullets had no effect. After seeing that the bullets were no use, Alcott ran back inside his office and barricaded himself inside, waiting until daylight before emerging. The next morning, Dr. Alcott told everyone about his scary encounter, and after hearing not one but now two people had witnessed this strange creature, the town was split on how to feel about the story. With about half thinking that there might be a strange-looking creature coming out at night, while others thinking that there was no way this could be real. If the men did really see something, surely they misinterpreted a common everyday animal for this beast. Some thought this was a straight up hoax, while others began to think that there was a robber in town disguising himself as a scary creature to hide his identity while he tried to get into local businesses. One man who did not believe the monster story was a bank manager named Clarence Dunn. He was convinced that there was going to be an attack on the only bank in town from robbers who were trying to scare people away from town so that they could easily get into the bank safe to rob it. He decided that he was going to stay the night inside the bank itself to defend it. A newspaper article claimed that Mr. Dunn left his family to fend for themselves inside their home as he went to the bank in the evening. He waited and again around 1 a.m., just like the other two sightings, he heard a strange sound coming from outside the bank. He also saw a strange bright light sweeping the grounds. Dunn slowly crept to the window when suddenly a large creature with bat-like wings and a horned face appeared in the window, staring directly at Dunn. Dunn was a skeptic, and this scared him so much that he screamed as he fired his weapon through the window, shattering the glass of the only bank in town. The creature shined its bright light into the now broken window and shot up into the sky. By morning, the townsfolk were starting to get really fearful. This was a huge monster that bullets apparently had no effect on, so the small town really didn't know what to do. By the fourth night of these sightings, things got even weirder. A businessman named O.V. White was sleeping above his hardware and furniture shop when he was woken by a strange sound around one o'clock in the morning. He said it sounded like files rubbing together loudly, and he went to the window to see what it was. That is when he saw the monster that people had been describing sleeping on a telephone pole across the street. O.V. opened his window and shot at the monster with no effect. 
the creature woke up and shined a spotlight right at Ovi's open window. Then he said that he smelled a strange and nasty odor, and after that, he had no memory of what happened until morning. It was as if he lost time. The shot that Ovi took at the creature had woken up Sidney Gregg, another businessman who was asleep over his own store. Gregg ran to the window just in time to see the monster climbing down the pole using its beak for support. After it got down on the ground, it extended its wings and hopped around on the ground much like a kangaroo. Greg watched in shock as the creature moved around on the ground. Suddenly, a train whistle from the train tracks sounded as the mail train was pulling into town like it did every early morning around one o'clock in the morning. The creature got down on all fours and began to run with its wings outstretched. Greg thought that the creature was going to attack the train that was about to pull into the station, but then the creature extended its wings even further and flew off into the sky, heading toward the old abandoned coal mine on the outskirts of town. By day five, people in town were really starting to panic, and no one knew what to do. The newspapers also began to pick up the story, spreading the monster sightings even further than just the small town. The abandoned coal mine's entrance was still open in 1903, but it had not been used for several years. After the mine's closure, the brick and tile factory continued to operate near the old mine entrance. Today, it's nothing more than a crumbling, abandoned structure. But in 1903, it was still operating as a full-time factory and had men working three different shifts, working nonstop for a full 24 hours a day. The monster sightings were going on its fifth night, and the manager of the brick and tile factory was outside taking a break when he suddenly heard a loud and strange sound coming from the abandoned coal mine. He had been hearing these strange sounds coming from the old mine shaft for several nights, and it was just now that he was wondering if it had anything to do with the odd sightings in town. Curiosity finally got the better of him and he went over to investigate. When he got closer to the entrance, he claimed to hear, and I quote from a local newspaper, what sounded like Satan and the regiment of his imps coming from hell to wage battle on the town. That's a weird way to describe a sound, but that's what he claimed he heard. After this, he ran back to the factory to get more men to come witness what he was hearing. And when the group of men got there, they saw not one, but two of these bat-like creatures emerging from the old coal mine entrance. The second one was said to be smaller than the eight-foot tall monster that people had been seeing in town, and the men watched from the cover of the tree line as these two monsters rose into the night sky and flew away. No one knows where they went that evening because there were no sightings that night in town. However, it was reported that on the fifth night, everyone in town had turned on every light that they had to try to scare these strange visitors away. Meanwhile, back at the old mine shaft, the men ran into town to get help. The factory was put on pause for the night as all the men ran back home to get their guns. All the men from town descended onto the coal mine shaft and some even began trying to board up the entrance. They waited and watched, and about daybreak, these creatures came back. When they did, they opened fire and gave these creatures everything that they had, and reports from people in town said that it sounded like a war zone had suddenly popped off on the hillside. Every gun in town was being used to fight these creatures off. All of the bullets seemed to have little to no effect, as both of these creatures hissed and snarled at the men, and they hopped past them and entered the mine shaft anyway. All the men quickly boarded up the entrance, trapping both creatures inside. The newspapers that morning claimed that they were going to try to destroy the shaft and hoped it would trap the creatures inside the miles of tunnels below it. And that's where the story just ends. There was never a follow-up and no one knows still to this day when or how the mine shaft was covered up. There are some other strange things missing from these accounts. Apparently, a plaster casting of the creature's footprints were taken, but they mysteriously disappeared. Some think that it might have been forgotten, or others think that possibly they were taken, while others think, you know, it's just a hoax, so of course there were no plaster castings. The story that was corroborated by the townspeople and many well-known respectable businessmen who put their reputation on the line to talk about their strange experience 
was slowly forgotten. After the brick and tile factory closed, teenagers would often go out to the now abandoned area to mess around and party, but it didn't take long for the whole area to get a haunted reputation. People would reportedly hear strange sounds, see large shadows moving in the dark, and see bright lights off in the tree line. They also claimed that heavy big bricks were often thrown on their own. People began to call it the brickyard haunting or even the brickyard creature. It was not really until the mid-80s that the story of the Van Meter visitor started to make its way back into the mainstream when new sightings of a large bat-like creature began to re-emerge. People still claim to see this visitor today and it's been getting a bigger following among the cryptid community. They even have the Van Meter Visitor Festival in its honor. No one knows what happened during the week in late September of 1903, but something big enough to scare the whole town occurred. Now, my mind immediately turned to a Thunderbird sighting, but I have never heard of one with a spotlight on its forehead, but this is just my thought, but what if the poor Thunderbird got a lantern stuck on its horn? That would be sad. Most people, of course, think that the story is completely made up. The TV show Expedition X covered this story on one of its episodes. I have a link down below to which one it was. However, they left a lot of stuff out and they didn't even talk about the light on the creature's forehead. And they also really didn't go in depth of what happened with the townsfolk. It made the skeptic in the group think that what the town was actually seeing was nothing more than the shadow of a bat. Because I guess around this time, the town had just got new street lamps, but it's easy enough on the surface, but when you really dig into this whole story, I think that something did happen and the shadow idea just doesn't fit. Something very bizarre happened in this town. What do you guys think about the Van Meter Visitor? And it's okay to be skeptical because honestly, this is a wild story and I really don't know what to think about it either. But like I always say, everyone's a skeptic until you are suddenly the one in the group with the experience that no one else will believe. The town of Villisca, Iowa was founded in 1858 by D.N. Smith, who worked for the Burlington and Quincy Railroad Company. Before colonizers came to the area, it was settled by the forefathers of what we now call the Sioux or Cherokee or the Iroquois. They used the plains for hunting and gathering and lived in small communities spread out throughout the territory. According to VillisCaHistory.org, Smith named the town Villisca because that is the word that the local tribes used to describe the area, and he believed that the word meant pretty place or pleasant view. However, according to other sources that I have linked down below, it's believed that Smith not only misheard the word, but he also just assumed that it meant pleasant view. The word he mistook for Valiska could have actually been the word Waliska with a W, which means evil spirit. Valiska is a small town located in Montgomery County, Iowa. The 2020 census put the population count at 1,132 people. During the early 1900s, the town grew to have over 2,500 residents thanks to its prominent railroad depot. Not only was the town a stopping place for Americans traveling out west via rail line, but the town also had a thriving agricultural business. More than two dozen passengers and freight trains stopped in the town every day, helping the town grow and created a good economy. The town soon had many hotels, restaurants, stores, manufacturers, and multiple theaters. The town was relatively quiet and it was thought to be a safe place to live and raise a family until one of the most famous cold cases in American history occurred on June 10th, 1912. Other than the case that I will get to in just a moment, I wanted to talk more about the town's history. Villisca has a military history that dates back to 1912 when they constructed Iowa's only publicly funded and longest operating armory. Villisca's Company F represented the town in the 1916 expedition into Mexico, along with fighting in World War I, World War II, 
Korea, and Vietnam Wars. Sadly, during World War II, Montgomery County lost more men per capita than any other county in the U.S. A Pulitzer Prize-winning photograph was taken of Lieutenant Colonel Robert Moore hugging his family after he came home from serving in Africa for 18 months during World War II. The picture was taken at the town's train depot, and it appeared in the July 26, 1943 issue of Life magazine. Today, the most popular thing to do in town is to check out the Velisca Axe Murder House. You can take tours of the home as well as conduct paranormal investigations. The town is roughly two hours away from Des Moines, Iowa, the home of Iowa's state capital, the Blank Park Zoo, Adventureland Park, Living History Farms, Greater Des Moines, Iowa's Botanical Gardens, and many more vacation destinations. While those attractions sound fun, we all know that ghosts and old crime scenes of unsolved murders are another popular tourist destination. Humans have had a fascination with cold cases ever since articles about Jack the Ripper graced the cover of every top newspaper during the Victorian period. The true crime craze had begun, and by the late 1800s, there was a string of famous axe murder cases springing up across America. One of these cases was the famous Lizzie Borden case in 1892, and I covered that for this year's Halloween episodes. Everyone was stunned to hear that the Borden's own daughter was the prime suspect, and it kicked off a media frenzy. But nothing was so disturbing and shocking as the case that came out of Villisca, Iowa, the night that six members of the Moore family and two guests were found bludgeoned to death in their own beds. Around 5 a.m. on June 10, 1912, a woman named Mary Peckham was awake and going about her morning chores. She had just finished doing some laundry and began hanging her clothes on lines outside to dry when she noticed that the farmhouse next door, owned by the Moore family, seemed eerily quiet. She kept an eye on the house while she went about her morning routine, but by 7 a.m., she became concerned. The Moores were a family of six, and they took running their farm seriously, and they always got up early to tend to the horses in the barn and other daily tasks. Mary noticed that the horses in the barn seemed restless, and they began neighing more than usual. Worried that the family had become sick, she decided to go over to the house to check on them. She knocked on the door multiple times and called out to the family, but the house remained dark. She tried to enter the home, but found the door locked, a very strange thing to do in a small town during this time period. Mary decided to help by quickly feeding the animals and letting the chickens out of their coop before returning to her house to call Joshua Moore's brother, asking him to help her check on the family. Little did she know what horrors awaited them inside. Before we enter the home, let's rewind a bit and look at the victims. Joshua Moore and his wife Sarah were prominent members of the Velisca community. Joshua, who also went by Joe and JB, was the owner of the Moore Implement Company. This company was part of the John Deere Company franchise. John Deere is still a famous company that makes farm tractors, farming equipment, and construction machinery. Joe Moore married his wife Sarah Montgomery on December 6, 1899. Sarah was born in Knox County, Illinois in 1873 and moved to Villisca with her parents around 1894. There are not many records regarding the family other than we know that Sarah and Joe married in 1899 and that they had four children together. Records up until the murders did not show any major scandals or any real trouble from the family. According to the community at large, the family was kind, well-liked, and helpful, even though they had a lot of money and power in town. Sarah was known to be a nice person and in good spirits whenever people greeted her. Joe Moore was devoted to his family, and he cared for his wife and children. It also seems like Joe really did love Sarah, and he made sure to spend time with his family, even though he was running a top business. Joe and Sarah's children were also described as well-behaved, and the two 
two eldest were good at making friends. Herman Moore was the oldest. Born in 1901, he was said to follow his father around the farm and in town like his shadow. At the time of his death, he was only 11 years old. But people described Herman as being interested in his father's work, and people assumed that he was learning about the work early to possibly take over the company when he grew up. Catherine was born in 1903 and was only 10 years old at the time of her death. Some articles I read said that Catherine was 9, while some claimed that she was 10, so I'm not sure if there was a record mix-up or what, but more articles claim that she was 10 than 9, so that's the one I'm going to go with. She was good friends with two of the Stillinger sisters, Lena Gertrude Stillinger, age 12, and Ina May Stillinger, age 7, and they were said to be inseparable. Sadly, that friendly bond would end up getting Lena and May killed from being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Boyd and Paul were the youngest of the Moore family. Boyd was seven years old, while Paul was only five years old at the time of their deaths. Little is known about the two youngest siblings, and there is only one photograph of them from when they were much younger. The Moore family were also members of their local Presbyterian church, with Sarah taking an active role in the children's youth group. The last day the Moore family, along with Lena and Ina Stillinger, were seen alive was June 9, 1912. Now remember that in 1912 Villisca, this was a bustling railroad town, busy with sending out goods and welcoming new faces every day. Sunday, June 9th, started as a busy day for the Moore family. Chores had to be done quickly because their church was hosting a children's day program that was being conducted by Sarah Moore. The family attended the early morning service and then went home for a quick lunch before Sarah returned to the church to finish setting up for the event. The event started later that evening, and after getting the children ready for their performances, it went well and everyone seemed to really enjoy it. There was something strange going on that night in town, however. The city had been in a long feud with its electric company named the Villisca Public Service Company. And don't let its name fool you. Just because it had public in their name, it was a private electric utility company. The argument had been brewing for months over better lighting and the replacement of some light poles along with new brick in the business district. I still can't find exactly what their arguments were about, but I know that it went all the way to the district court and it was getting very heated. The company got so angry with the city that they decided to make a point that they were important by choosing to cut off the city's lights that night. This was in the summertime, so the sun did not really start to set until around 9 o'clock at night, so I doubt that this had much effect on the church's Children's Day program. It is unknown if the church even had electricity at this time, because it was still a relatively new invention, especially in rural towns, and many people had not yet installed it in their homes, including the Moore family. The Children's Day program concluded around 9.30 at night and everyone had a good time. However, the people inside the church did notice how dark the streets were after they left the church. There are two versions of what happened next. One is that Catherine had asked her parents if Ina and Lena could come over for a sleepover since the whole Stillinger family was also at the event and their parents talked it over and agreed that the girls could stay the night at the Moors. Another version of this story is that for some reason the Stillinger girls' parents were not at the event, leaving Lena and Ina Stillinger to walk home together after the program was over. However, thanks to the power being cut off, the streets were dark and Ina and Lena were afraid to walk home. So Catherine had asked her parents if they could stay the night at their house, and Sarah and Joe agreed. Joe then went to a phone box and called the Stillinger's household to talk to their parents, but the older sister Blanche answered the phone, and Joe told her to let her parents know that the girls were going to stay the night with them. Regardless of how it happened, after the Children's Day program wrapped up, the Moore family, along with the two Stillinger girls, walked to their house that was roughly three blocks away from the church. It was estimated that they got home around 10.45 p.m. And now we are back to the morning of June 10, 1912. 
After Mary Peckham went back to her home to call Joe's brother, Ross Moore, Ross arrived at the home around 8 o'clock in the morning. He and Mary banged on the doors and windows trying to get someone's attention. Ross tried to look into the windows of the home, but he found all of the curtains drawn. Ross then took a spare key that Joe and Sarah had given him and he let himself in. Ross walked inside the door while Mary waited for him on the front porch. The house was eerily quiet and dark due to every window in the house being covered. Ross cautiously walked into the living room and then pushed open the door to the ground floor bedroom. That is when he saw two small bodies laying on the two beds in the guest room covered in a bloody sheet. Ross ran from the room out to the porch where he quickly told Mary to run and call for the sheriff. When authorities arrived, they found the rest of the family dead in their beds. The two small bodies Ross had discovered were Lena and Ina Stillinger. City Marshal Hank Horton discovered the rest of the victims. Horton was not a trained officer. He was actually a local carpenter and was the biggest man in town, so the city gave him the job to deal with rowdy drunks. That is how underprepared this town was to handle any real crimes. Horton also discovered the bodies of 43-year-old Joshua Moore and 39-year-old Sarah Moore laying in their beds. Their heads had been covered with a blood-soaked sheet, while the rest of the bed covers were stained with blood as well. Their head and faces were beat to unrecognition. Both had been bludgeoned in with a blunt object. The rest of the family and the two Stillinger girls were killed in the same brutal way. By now, two of the town's doctors had also come to the scene, J. Clark Cooper and Edgar Hoff. Wesley Ewing, the local Presbyterian church minister, also arrived at the same time. The men discovered that all the children inside the home were killed the same way as Joe and Sarah, but they had clothing covering their heads along with a sheet covering their whole bodies. There are many more elements to this case that are just straight up messed up and creepy, but we don't know what the crime scene looked like 100%. This is because not long after the bodies were discovered, word of the murder spread throughout the town like wildfire, and hundreds of people ran to the Moore property. The doctors on scene tried to urge people to stay out of the house, but many did not listen and went inside anyway to see for themselves what had happened. Witnesses stated that people were running from room to room in shocked excitement at what had happened to the Moore family members. Marshall Horton could not keep people back from the home, so he ran into town to get help, leaving his deputy, Mike Overman, a man in his young 20s, to deal with the house. However, this just made things worse because Overman not only had zero training on how to handle such a crowd, he was also not seen by many as having an authority figure. So people paid him no attention as they entered the home anyway. It is estimated that about 100 people entered the house. While inside, they moved objects and took souvenirs from the scene. One such souvenir was a piece of Joe Moore's skull about the size of a cigarette packet. Another was some of Sarah Moore's personal jewelry. It is also believed that the murder weapon was moved from room to room by the crowd, so any real evidence that was left behind is now ridiculously contaminated. In 1912, forensic evidence was not completely understood, and many people had zero clue that waltzing into a crime scene was one of the worst things you could do, not just by disrupting the case and making it impossible to find the killer, but nowadays, you could incriminate yourself by doing that. The crowd grew throughout the morning, and around noon, the Villisca National Guard was called in to help get people out of the home. Around midday, the sheriff from local Page County came to the house to start an official investigation. He was met with chaos in and outside of the home. The National Guard was still trying to usher excited gawkers out of the house, and there was a significantly large crowd growing outside of the home. So by this time, the crowd had grown to over 1,000 people. By now, word had spread to other nearby towns, and people rushed to the scene. It was easy to see that the crime scene was a complete disaster, and the officers had little to go on due to everything being moved around and many items straight up missing from the house. 
There was now only eyewitness testimony from the first men on the scene. However, other than the two doctors, none of the men were trained officials, and they only saw the crime scene untouched for about 20 to 30 minutes before people started showing up in mass and began moving items around. Because of this, it is hard to know exactly how the crime scene looked after the bodies were discovered. That is not a lot of time to look around properly and remember exactly where everything was. Plus, the house was super dark due to all the windows being covered. Dr. Cooper stated that he entered the home and performed rigor mortis tests on the bodies. He also studied the pools of blood to see how much it had clotted, and this helped him estimate that they were killed about eight to nine hours before they had been discovered. So that would mean that the whole family and the two Stillinger girls had been killed sometime around midnight. Records also show that Dr. Cooper did not test the body's temperatures of the victims, so it's thought that he only spent about 15 minutes total inside the house. Dr. Cooper also said that he was not focusing on the things around him, he was only focusing on the victims. When the county coroner, Dr. Lindquist, from nearby staff in Ohio arrived, he stated that the home was still in disarray with people running around the house. He had to wait until the guard had finally got a handle on the situation before he began his initial investigation. This is where the story takes an even more disturbing turn. So I just wanted to warn you that the next part is going to be even more icky than the actual deaths but the men who were examining the crime scene thought that this might have been a sexual attack. Dr. Lindquist examined the bodies of all of the female victims to check them for any signs of abuse. However, they determined that none of the female victims had any signs to support that theory. The rest of the formal investigation goes as follows. The way that the victims were killed was determined to be by blows from the blunt end of a large axe, and it's believed that it was Joe Moore's own axe that he normally kept inside the coal shed in the back. The blood-stained axe was found inside the guest bedroom downstairs, and it looked like the killer tried to wipe off the handle. It is believed that the killer killed the parents first, and then proceeded to each child. After he performed the killing blows, he went back and beat each skull until it was a bloody pulp. Joe Moore's face had the most damage out of the whole family. Whoever committed this crime swung the axe so hard and so many times that the sharp end of the axe hit the ceiling and walls multiple times, leaving marks that are still visible today. Another odd thing was that the whole family appeared to be asleep during the murders, but the house is very small, and it's odd that no one seemed to have woken up during the attack. Now, I have seen the house. Uh, Dawn from Misfit Apparitions was kind enough to give me a little virtual tour of the home after our interview, and... After seeing it, even through the camera, I found it so weird that no one woke up. As Dawn and the rest of the crew were walking around the house giving me a tour, I could hear them walking through the home and making lots of noise just taking steps across the wood floor. So it's just weird to me that no one woke up during the attack. Well, it's believed that one of them might have woken up during the attack. Lena Stillinger was found partly out of bed with her arm up over her head and she might have had a defensive wound on her arm. So the rest of the victims lay exactly where they were killed. So some theorize that she might have woken up and tried to fight off her attacker. Others think that Lena might have been moved after her death. The first witnesses on the scene also noted that it looked like Lena's nightgown had been pulled up and apparently her underwear was missing, so that is really disturbing. And as if all of those findings weren't horrible enough, the rest of the findings get even more creepy. It is thought that the killer spent hours inside the house while the family was dead from the attack. All of the windows were covered with curtains and the windows that didn't have curtains were covered with random pieces of clothing. The victim's faces were also covered. The parents were covered with linens, while the children's faces were covered with random pieces of the family's clothing. Another strange thing was that every mirror and reflective surface inside the home had also been covered with clothing, cloths, or towels. A bloody bowl of water was found in the kitchen, and a piece of uncooked bacon wrapped in a cheesecloth from the family's icebox was found on the living room 
bathroom floor. They also found a random keychain. A much later find was a kerosene lamp with its chimney off that was found at the foot of the Stillinger girl's bed underneath the dresser, and the mirror inside their room was covered with a black skirt. In the parents' room, another kerosene lamp missing its chimney was found on the floor, and possibly another lamp missing its chimney was found on the staircase, because one of the doctors claimed that he had moved it out of his way as he went up the stairs. But again, these men only spent about 20 to 30 minutes inside the home before a hundred people trampled through the house, moving items, including the very obvious murder weapon all over the house. So they took items from the crime scene as well. So who's to say what it 100% looked like in the beginning? While the investigation was going on inside the home, outside, the crowd had grown to over 2,000 people. The town was also giving in to mass hysteria. People were terrified that there was a mad axe man on the loose and large posses of armed men formed to go around town looking for anyone suspicious. There was also a run on locks. Not many people had locks on their doors during this time, so now everyone was in a hurry to get some for their doors and even their windows. This caused all the hardware stores for multiple towns around the area to sell out in a matter of hours, as thousands of locks were purchased. The authorities did not have much to go on and the people in town were beginning to panic. So they quickly brought in bloodhounds to see if they could give them a lead. An Iowa state senator named Frank F. Jones paid for the dogs who came from Nebraska and they did not arrive until around 8.30 that same evening on June 10th. They let the bloodhounds sniff the ax and hoped that they would lead them to the killer. But the authorities all knew that hundreds of random people were just inside the house and many had picked up the axe so I don't get how they thought this would work but okay. Another problem was that the dogs faced a huge crowd of over 2,000 people that were still outside the home and when the dogs began their search this large crowd ran behind the dogs distracting them while they were trying to keep up with the dog's movements. The dogs took the group to a nearby river before the trail ran cold. The dogs did this two times, and both times the trail went cold by the river. But again, my question is, how were the dogs supposed to know what scent to follow when around 100 people had been picking up and messing with the axe? This whole thing blows my mind, and also, did the town really have any respect for the Moore family, or were they all just faking being nice and then talking smack behind their backs? Because while they all said how nice the family was, they certainly didn't show them any respect after they died, and to me, that speaks volumes. Of course, once the newspapers got a hold of this story, the media had a field day and rumors began spreading throughout town that maybe the Moore family was not so squeaky clean after all. Two days later, the funeral for the eight victims was held. Thousands of people showed up for the service, and the National Guard was called yet again to keep order. There was such a large crowd at the service that the city kept the caskets locked in the firehouse until it was time for them to be moved to the cemetery due to security concerns. Fifty carriages were used in the funeral procession as thousands of people lined the streets, craning their necks to gawk as the National Guard tried to keep people back. The more Four family members were buried together in a mass plot at the Velisca Cemetery with one large monument stone displaying the family's name. There are also small individual headstones for each person. Lena and Ina Stillinger were also buried in the same cemetery, laying side by side, and they share one headstone. After the funeral, a coroner's inquest was held where 14 witnesses testified. Each person recounted what they did the day that the bodies were discovered. Discovered. Witnesses were also asked if they knew anyone who may have a reason to harm the Moores family. Ed Selly, who ran the store for Joe Moore, testified that Joe's brother-in-law, Sam Moore, had threatened Joe not long before the murders. However, Moyer had an airtight alibi and was soon cleared as a suspect. 
With no suspect named, the newspapers began snooping around for their own leads. Not long after the funeral, new rumors began circulating throughout town that Joe Moore was in a bitter dispute with State Senator Frank F. Jones, the same senator who had paid for the bloodhounds to come search for the killer. Joe Moore had worked under Frank Jones for several years and was Jones' best salesman for his farm equipment business. Moore left and started his own farm equipment business in 1907, possibly because Moore was required to work 16 hours a day, six days a week. When Moore left, he also took Jones's best supplier, John Deere, with him. Adding to this gossip, there was another story circulating that Moore was having a secret affair with Jones's daughter-in-law, Donna Jones. There were many scandalous stories involving Donna circulating through town, however, most people also called her the town flirt, so it's really hard to know for sure if that's true or not. Once the idea that Frank Jones was a suspect, it quickly split the town into two groups. Jones was a prominent Methodist, so his Methodist congregation insisted of his innocence. The Moore's congregation of Presbyterians were positive that Jones must have committed or at least paid someone to do the murders. In addition to the local gossip and newspaper stories circulating, private detectives from the region became interested in the case and began searching for suspects themselves. Some started wondering if there was a serial killer on the loose. Between 1911 and 1912, there had been a string of axe murders along the train lines in the states of Washington, Colorado, Illinois, and Kansas. There was also another murder not long after Velisca that happened in Missouri. A detective named Wilkerson came forward with a theory that Senator Jones hired William Blake Mansfield to kill the Moors. Wilkerson was sure that Mansfield was responsible for these axe murders that happened in Colorado and Kansas. The Kansas murder happened only four days after Velisca. The murders had something in common too. The victims had been hacked to death and and the mirrors were all covered. Wilkinson believed that Mansfield had worn gloves because he already had a criminal record and his fingerprints were on file. Mansfield was also known to be an addict of cocaine, so Detective Wilkerson theorized that the attacks happened during a drug-induced rage. Wilkerson finally was able to get a grand jury to investigate Mansfield and State Senator Frank F. Jones. It turned out that Mansfield had proof of an alibi. There were payroll records that showed that he was employed in Illinois at the time, so Mansfield was released and the case against Jones was dropped due to lack of evidence. There were still several locals who believed that he had used his power and influence to put a stop to the investigation. All of this publicity and bad press ruins Jones's political career, making him lose his next election. Even though much time had passed, people still wanted answers and the police in town started to look into anyone who was out of the ordinary. Another man that became a person of interest and a source of town gossip was J.H. Barrett. Barrett had a reputation for being eccentric, showing strange behavior in public, and jumping to anger, but he was quickly cleared. Another man obsessed with the case was Andy Sawyer. He worked on the railroad line, and he was known for using an axe, and he even slept with it. It was also said that he was paranoid. He talked about the case a lot and read every newspaper article he could get his hands on. His strange behavior raised suspicions that he might have been involved. Involved. His boss called the authorities, but it was proven that he was 75 miles away in another town in Iowa at the time of the murders. In 1917, Reverend George Jacqueline Kelly was arrested for the murders. Kelly had been a traveling preacher until he settled in Macedonia, Iowa in 1912 with his wife. He was seen as peculiar, having a mental breakdown when he was younger. He had also been accused at times of being a peeping Tom. He had also asked many women and young girls to pose nude for him. So, you know, he was gross. Authorities discovered that he had been invited to attend the Presbyterian Church's Children's Day program the night of the Velisca 
axe murders. Those in attendance described him as a strange skinny person at the back of the church. He spent the night at Reverend Ewing's house in Villisca and left at 519 in the morning on a train headed for his home. Because of this, he was arrested in 1917, but the first grand jury could not make a unanimous decision. A second grand jury found him not guilty. Even though he had confessed while under interrogation, the jurors did not believe it was sincere. Also, he was a small man, only 5 foot 1 inches tall, and weighed only about 120 pounds. It was believed that the murderer had to be a larger man, so Kelly was never convicted. Another detective believed that Henry Lee Moore, no relation to the Moore family, was a serial killer responsible for the axe murders from 1911 to 1912. Detective McClothley discovered Moore was in jail for killing his own mother and grandmother in Columbia, Missouri, a few months after the Villisca murders, with an axe in a way closely resembling the Moore's family killing. Henry Moore was never arrested for the Villisca killings, and he remained in prison for killing of his mother and grandmother until 1956 when he was released at the age of 82. After that, the trail ran cold, and there has never been a definitive answer to the murders. The case has been revisited many times, but since it happened over 100 years ago, it's unlikely that we will ever know the truth of who killed the Moore family and the two Stillinger girls. But there have been many theories, from it was a serial killer who was traveling on the train, to it was indeed Senator Jones who had hired a hitman to do it and then staged the murders to look like the very publicized axe murders that were happening across the U.S. to throw the police off their trail. Some do think think it was that creepy reverend named Kelly who might have had some twisted fascination with Lena Stillinger and that is why her body was moved after she died. There are also some theories as to how the killer got into the house. Some articles I came across said that the family never locked their doors like the rest of town but when I looked into that I found testimony from one of John Moore's brothers and he said that it was in fact normal for John to lock the doors in the house so if that was true the killer had to somehow sneak into the house undetected either while the family was still at home getting ready for the Children's Day Festival or he had to break into the house while they were still at the church and then he waited for them to get back home so that the family would then lock the killer inside with them when they got home. And that is a super creepy thought and I'm not going to pretend that while I was writing this episode that I did not check into all my closets and the bathtub and everything every time I came home before I went to bed. But here's the thing. I grew up hearing that the killer hid inside the attic due to cigarette butts being found on the floor. But when I looked into my deep dive into this case, I could not find much about that at all. Some articles said that he might have hid in a downstairs closet, while others said that possibly the attic might have been where he hid. And most of the articles didn't say a word about that even being a theory. So another article that I found said that he may have hid in the barn, but if the doors were locked, then I don't really see how hiding in the barn was helpful unless the killer also knew how to pick locks. And if that was the case, then this could have pointed to a more calculated attack like a hit. And we can all keep speculating all day, but sadly, we will never know who killed this family or why while they peacefully slept after a whole day of fun. While this story as a whole is horrific, let's not forget the victims who did not deserve to die in such a brutal way. They were not respected after their deaths, so let's try to give them the respect that they deserve today. This case has gone down in history of one of the most famous cold cases in America, and the town continues to circulate rumors and different theories to this day. After the Moores family and the two Stillinger girls' death, the home earned the name the Murder House by locals. The house itself was built in 1868, and it was purchased by by the Moors in 1903. After the murders, the home was owned by a total of eight different people over the years. In 1994, Mr. and Mrs. Lynn purchased the home and the house was in bad shape. The couple worked hard to restore it and by 1998, the house was back to how it looked when the Moors lived there. Mr. Lynn passed away in 2011 and his wife kept the house to still be used for tours and investigations. The axe marks on the walls and the ceilings 
are still visible today, and the current owners offer tours and allow paranormal investigations. The house still has no electricity, and the furnishings are time period accurate. They also keep any mirrors in the house covered. The house is known to be extremely haunted, with people and investigators having very unique paranormal experiences. Before I get to the ghost stories of the home, I would like to put in my interview with Misfit Apparitions right now. Just a reminder that the video of our interview will be posted on my YouTube channel, Historically Haunted Podcast, as well as their YouTube channel, Misfit Apparitions. I have links to both of our pages down below in the show notes, along with their website, MisfitApparitions.com. If you watch the video, I nod a lot during the interview, <laughs> so much that I look like a bobblehead at times. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Um, it was probably because I was really nervous. I get nervous anytime I do something new technically, and I, I have a lot of anxiety, so I move around a lot. And for some reason, I chose to move my head a lot instead of like my hands or something that weren't in frame. But um, yeah, so I just want to let you know I look like a bobblehead for some weird reason. Reason. I usually don't do that, but I did. But um, oh well, I hope you guys still will enjoy it and just ignore my little box where I'm moving my head weird. Like I said before, the house had no electricity or Wi-Fi, so our call was a little bit spotty at times, but I did my best in post to make their interview sound as clean and crisp as I could. And I also wanted to let you know that for some reason with the recording software that I use, the sound is only coming out of the left side of the headphones. So if you have headphones on, you're going to need to put in your your left earbud. I do apologize for that. It was my first time doing an interview and I don't know what happened, but somehow it will not play out of both headphones without there being a terrible buzzing sound and I cannot figure out how to get rid of it. But other than that technical glitch, the interview sounds really good, so I'm really excited for you guys to hear it. Some of the members' names cut out, sadly, due to lag during the call and I didn't catch it until it was too late. So I would like to welcome Don, Ernest, Mike, Crystal and Sergio to our interview. And Don is the first person who introduced himself and sadly it lagged right when he said his name. So I wanted to let you all know their names so that way we could get the interview started. All right, and here begins the interview. I hope you enjoy. And now I would like to welcome to the podcast, Don, Ernest, Mike, Crystal, and Sergio. And together they form the paranormal group Misfit Apparitions. They are a team that investigates paranormal locations and they also have a podcast called Misfit Apparitions, the podcast, now streaming on Spotify and other streaming apps. You can also check out their website at misfitapparitions.com and I will have a link to their website down below in the show notes for you guys to check out. So thank you guys so much for being here today for this interview. Thank you for having us. Really My first question um, is basically just an intro. So it's just please introduce yourself or yourselves and tell me about your ghost hunting group. Okay, um, I'm the, and uh, my, I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about, about how I got into this. It was just through cemeteries in high school. And uh, I used to go to cemeteries with my friends in high school just for fun. So I'm going to pass this over to Mike. I'm Mike. Um, I've been interested in the paranormal for ever since I was a little kid as well. When I lived in Missouri on my own farm for a while, we actually used to play a game called Ghosts of the Graveyard, which is basically just hide and go seek, but it's very creepy atmosphere. I've, I have had experiences in the past, but as I've gotten older, I've become more skeptical. So now I kind of do this for the fun of it. And to be tested, I want to be proven wrong. I want to, I want something to happen. I want to know that it is real. So yeah, there's that's me. Hi, I'm Marcus. Uh, I've been interested in the paranormal for a long time. Uh, I've had different locations I've lived at that uh, strange things would happen, um, especially like with animals. And, uh, one dog would always chase things around the house. Ooh. And then at one point, I was living in a house that was haunted, um, seeing dark shadows and been touched back my neck. So that kind of got me uh, into the current Hi, I'm Crystal. Um, I've been doing paranormal investigation for over a decade now. Um, it started as a young child, having premonitions, and for the luckiest reason, I tracked a lot of things, some good and some bad. And so as an adult, you know, I'm not scared of those things anymore, and so I take them on. How are you doing? I'm Sergio. Basically, I'm just the person that's trying to figure out 
the real update. Now I want to make sure that something does happen to me and I'm able to explain it or tell somebody, yeah, it's a real thing. But at this point, it hasn't happened. I've been doing this for maybe 10 years, 15 years. I'm getting pretty curious about it. Wow, thank okay. you guys. My next question is, um, what started the group? Like, um, what started all of you guys deciding to go out and ghost hunt together? It started for me, well, the Misfit Apparitions kind of started when there was a cemetery called Martha's Chapel Cemetery. It's somebody I, I worked with had talked about a road called Bowden Road and how haunted this whole area was. So after work one day, I needed to find out for myself. I didn't really experience anything, but Ernest heard about it. Mike heard about it. They wanted to come with me. We journeyed out there. During the witching hour, uh, probably a, less than a year later, and then prior to going there, Crystal had lent me some of her equipment because uh, I, we didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. So Crystal's equipment, we used it, and then Crystal and we all went to Mineral Wells to investigate on a hill house in January of this year, and that's how Misfit Apparitions came to be when they joined up in the summertime. Oh, awesome. Okay, very cool. What equipment do you guys like to use for your investigations? I'm going to let Crystal answer this one. Sure. Um, I really enjoy the spirit box and the EMF reader. Ooh. I'm more about just recording. Hopefully you picked up some EVPs or something, go back home and listen to it after. But I'm just trying to figure out the real thing. Can I hear something else? Ernest, you want to answer? Uh, I really enjoy the REM pod and the K2, but like Sergio, I like the uh, recording is what they do best, and I like CVP. Mike? Flashlights. Yeah, I love flashlights. Oh, <laughs> cool. But I also, I made this little little uh, rig or whatever, little gadget or whatever that I can mount my cell phone to and can connect it to a, a, a webcam that does infrared and low light, and that's probably like my proudest <laughs> cool. Wow, that's actually really awesome. Have you guys had any success with the flashlights? I'm just curious. Um, I mean, yeah, I would say so, especially this little guy right here. That's how I'm lighting the room right now. I mean, without it, it's pitch black. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's no power in this house, though. So. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for that. Um, we're gonna dive into a little more of the Valinska Axe Murder House now, the house that you guys are in. Um, what were your first impressions walking into the home? Uh, for myself, I already had the creeps when I walked in. Johnny Hauser gave us a tour, about a 45 minute tour. He's a caretaker and there was a couple rooms that I felt the hairs on the back of my neck just stand up. Um, can, especially the Stillinger room downstairs where the two girls were murdered. Um, let me look past the mic too, real quick. Mm -hmm. There you go. I haven't felt anything. I haven't seen or heard anything. Um, like I said, I'm just in here. To me, it's a regular house. Pitch black. I'm ready to find out what really happens. Um, so for me, I've four or balls that light up on touch. And so some of the rooms that kind of spoke out to me that I think that there might be the majority of activity in, I put uh, one downstairs in the bedroom and then upstairs in the parents' room, also in the children's room, and then in the attic. Um, so those are the, the four rooms that really stood out to me that I feel we we're going to experience something good there. Uh, for me, I think uh, being here, the, the house is pretty, I like the way but to back from 1912, um, it's really awesome. Uh, the house is a, little, a lot smaller than pictures, uh, but uh, like John, I think for me, I'm, I'm not I'm feeling really creepy about the Stillinger bedroom down here. Uh, calling my name though. Mm. Yeah, I don't. I like I don't like Sergio said. I haven't really felt anything yet. Uh, but the night's still young. Maybe I'll get lucky tonight. Um, but when we first got here, I just I thought it looked cool. Like the artist was saying, how they kind of kept that 19th century or whatever, 1900s, that kind of aesthetic to it. I don't know, it's charming to me, I think. I could really. <laughs>
this is one question that I really do want to ask someone who's actually inside because I hear this a lot in the research I've done. Um, I've heard that the house is smaller than people realize, um, considering, you know, the, the tragedy that happened there. And there's this thought among some, uh, like, historians as to why nobody woke up during the event because the home is uh, smaller than you'd think for all the, you know, sad things that happened in the home. Um, and I was just wondering, is it pretty tiny um, when you guys are inside or is it bigger than people make it out to sound? I think we all agree it's, it's a lot smaller than we, uh, than we anticipated. Even driving in to see the house, it was my first notice was like how small it was. It's it's pretty tiny. Um, you'll see it when we move the camera around, but it's a pretty small house. It's just hard to believe, especially the upstairs, it being so small that nobody woke up and knew what was going on in a room just next to a home. But even us, we can hear each other breathing in the room next door because they're so close to each other and just their capacity. That is so weird to me. That's one of the weirdest elements of this case, personally. So, yeah, that's weird. And um, I realize the investigation um, is still early, uh, but have you guys uh, had any experiences yet? Or has anyone heard anything or thought they might have seen something? Uh, no, but I revved them up and been still in your room by taunting a little bit Ooh. just to get, get it going. Um, Johnny Hauser had kind of said that was a way to kind of get things going. So I went ahead and started that. We have a REM pod up in the attic that was going off like crazy. Oh. Um, by itself, we had seen it in the surveillance cameras that we have set up in the barn, um, the, the monitors. So we have cameras in every room here in the house so we can watch what's going on. Oh, um, very cool. For tonight, we had a couple sessions, one from midnight and one at three that Crystal and Ernest will go into the attic and we're going to do the Estes method. Um, Mike and I have written down questions that they don't know we're going to ask. So we hope that we get something from that. So with the four uh, orb balls that only activate upon touch, the one in the kids' room upstairs uh, next to the parents' room was going off um, for a while. Mm. And we see from the footage in the barn, like nobody was in the house and it was going off by itself. Oh, wow. that That's and, something. You know, the other thing that did happen, uh, I do have a co-worker that she says she's kind of psychic. I told her I was going to come. I, I did not give her any information about what happened, what room. I send her pictures of their room. And the first thing she tells me, hey, make sure you hang out where those, those, that, that white bed's at. I just took a small clip of a picture, and I just showed her one simple bed. And when, what happened, she asked me what happened in that room. Well, there's three bedrooms in there. That's where... All the kids were sleeping, or the four kids, and that's where four, the four children died. Like, yeah, you, you got to hang out in that room. I have a feeling that room's a special room tonight. But let's see how well she is with that information. Oh, wow. Wow, that's... uh. That's really cool when people have psychic friends. I don't have anyone like that, but I've heard of that being actually a pretty good key. Like, it'll hone in and people will be able to find out things that way. So that's really cool. Uh, and then this is a question I had too. Um, did the owner um, of the house or the, the caretaker who took you on the tour, did he give you guys any advice or warnings about the house? Uh, Martha Lynn did not speak anything about the house and I spoke to her on two occasions. She just basically went over rules. Mm -hmm. um, and, but Mr. Hauser, whom we met today, was very informative. He gave us a great tour. He gave us his theories. Um, yeah, overall, it was he was really good. He's been here over 700 times. He slept in this house. He actually lives in Mary Peckham's house, who was the woman who actually knocked on the door in the morning to get them to find out what was going on. So he lives in her house next door. Oh, wow. And, uh, so he, he told us about how he met Darwin Lynn, uh, who bought the house in 1993 or 94, and how he just kind of came. And great shape. And since then, he's just been caretaking this house. He's told us he's been here on special events. He's seen so many things. And um, it was interesting. He's a really nice guy. I have a question before the last question, actually. Um, I just thought of it on the fly. What are your theories as to what happened? Do you guys have, like, any theories about the case? I think we all have our own. Mine are just um, after reading Man on the Train. 
Um, I didn't really buy into the serial murder because it just, I don't know, the, the way the book was written, maybe it wasn't written correctly, but I kind of think since this was an Indian hunting ground, that there are probably some, some energy um, from that time period. But Johnny Hauser kind of dispelled that with what he had to say, but I'll let everybody else go through and see what they think. Okay. What do you think? Uh, I'm not sure what I think, but like I'm kind of on board with that. that like just, it could be the land, not the house. Um, and maybe just the, the, just like the perfect storm with the energy, the right ill person walking by or just a trash to do it or something. Um, but other than that, I'm kind of, I, don't, I really I don't really have any other theories outside of that. <laughs> Uh, who was it, the, that preacher? I think just like every, a lot of other people, they like I don't know how he was found not guilty or whatever, just because he seemed like he'd be the most likely suspect. Uh, mm -hmm. But other than that, yeah, that's about all I got right now. What do you think, Ernst? Uh, I think there's a lot of different groups that come through here. I think they leave stuff here. Um, but as far as person who may have done it, I'm thinking that it was uh, a good friend of his. Uh, Frank Jones. Yeah, Jones. Uh, his partner mm -hmm. that he left with, with whatever. Uh, I think he's the one behind it, but that's just what I think. So I have a little bit of a different theory than everyone here. Um, I do believe it was a, a serial killer, but I believe he was drawn to the house. Um, I believe that he had no ties to the family and that I feel hard and feel like I'm solving those cases today. Um, it was kind of confirmed, like I feel that my suspicions were confirmed that they were we got our tour. He had mentioned that someone that was drawn to this house from Las Vegas um, came and visited the family or the people that were investigating last night. And they had to actually have them removed from the property. And he was found in the cemetery shortly after sleeping. Um, and again, he said that he was drawn to the house. And so that before we even said information, um, just me analyzing the whole situation that it was an individual who was drawn to the house and what he did it is, you know, what played out through his mind and just what has taken over his body. And that's really what happened. I mean, you know, let's take out the, you know, the father first and then move on to the kids and the mother. Based on the data and everything that I've read or seen, I'm going to go more with the preacher. He had more of I guess you say more access to it or even being around the neighborhood and after that having the opportunity to take off. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to add a little bit to it where I think that was the case, the, I guess, the murder suspect. But after 100 years and all these people trying to investigate and bring stuff into this house, this is the negativity that's left behind or the things that get stirred up. It's a totally different story after 100 years. Those are all really, really good theories and <laughs> different. I love the different takes. <laughs> so thank you guys. My last question uh, before I wrap up the interview is um, this is more of a broader term. And I know we've got some skeptics and some people that haven't had anything happen. But um, for those of you who have experienced something paranormal happen, um, what was the most intense or even scary paranormal experience that you guys have experienced while either hunting or on your own? Who wants to answer this one? Is anybody? Ernest? Crystal? Okay. Uh, I would say that the most scariest that I had the most done to me, like, you know, be uh, lifted and touched and constantly moved to be just Oh my gosh. Um, so he did. He, he, he came to walk the street and then he 
posted the history of the place, and then we went and ventured back in, and the hotel actually had a book uh, downstairs. And in the book, you can read, you know, other guests and their experiences, and it just so happened many other guests experienced the same thing to the tea. And um, I just, it really sent chills down my body to know that I had no history, but yet the same thing happened to me, that other females that had stayed in that room had happened to them as well. Wow. That is scary. It did not happen to me. I was there. It has, it has to be 2011. At that time, my daughter was two years old. I ended up going to Veros Plantation in Louisiana. Um, I know my daughter was playing a little alley between the gift shop and the actual plantation. And she was smiling, giggling, the little alley. When she comes back out, she was just like real happy. I don't know why they just over here for so it's a little bit of the floor they have. And then during the floor, that's where the floor back there was roll up between the alley. This is the last time we saw um this core week, the girl the ghost, the uh, lady that's supposed to be ran the place, and that's where she was hanging out with the I guess you can say back then with the children. And it was just kind of creepy and weird where my daughter was hanging out in that alley, smiling, having a good time by herself. And I think Ernest has one. Uh, Mineral Well. Right? Yeah, earlier this year we went to uh, Mineral Well and Haunted Mule Alley. Uh, we were upstairs in the Toby's room. And uh, at that time I was looking in the corner where the attic is, a little small arch, and I was able to see these green eyes. And uh, that was kind of creepy. Um, and I can say this, that ever since that investigation, I've had some pretty vivid, strange dreams since then. So. Yeah, um, mine's not so much paranormal, it's just, I haven't been able to, it's one of the few things that really can't explain it. Um, whenever I was like, I don't know, I was, let's say I was about a teenager, that doesn't really matter, but I was a younger person. And for some reason, I that uh, I have a memory from when I was a, a, a toddler, like I don't even know, like maybe a year or two old, or maybe three, I don't remember exactly. But I remember asking my mom about this. I told her, was there a time when I was playing in a sandbox and then I got covered with fire ants? And I remember that happening and my dad rushing out, picking me up, running me into the kitchen, while rinsing me off in the kitchen sink. And my mom just sat there quiet for a second. And, um, and she was like, no, that didn't happen to you. That happened to your sister while I was pregnant with you. But I, like a vivid, I still remember like it was yesterday. Oh. Like it happened in my eyes. So not really paranormal, just weird. That's weird. Yeah. Interesting, and but then, weird. <laughs> and I want to add on to Ernest's uh, experience because I was with him when he saw those green eyes. Mm. And there's video on our YouTube channel. We didn't know that the owners had put cameras everywhere in the house. And there's a video of him saying, you can see he's looking behind a wall. And he turns to me and he said, dude, I just saw a pair of green eyes. And I, I said to him, shut up. And like, I didn't believe him. So when we left the place, Ernest and I drove back. It's about a four or five hour drive back to Houston. We almost got in two accidents, almost hit by two different cars. And about an hour and a half into the trip, I see him turn his head towards the back seat. It was just the two of us in the car. And he just looked at me and said, somebody, I felt a kick on my seat. And after he said that, I felt a tug on my pant leg, um, of my, you know, on my pants. So we immediately stopped and hot boxed the car with Sage. We kind of cleanse ourselves because we were warned about Toby. The demonic at mineral wells so that's oh. what that case we all had a <laughs> you almost had a hitchhiker it sounds like oh <laughs> you. followed you home <laughs> oh that's scary wow wow those were great thank you guys so much um that is all of the questions i had um that i typed up i hope that was okay and long enough for you guys <laughs> <laughs> but um, absolutely thank you all so much for doing this and um i had so much fun and i wish you guys luck ghost hunting the rest of the night and i would love a follow-up to hear if you guys caught anything and or anything like that um so uh before oh. we uh end the uh, recording part um don why don't you uh tell my audience more about how to find more information about your your group 
Um, well, we're on Facebook. Unfortunately, it's misfit spelled miss, M-I-S space F-I-T apparitions. And we're on Instagram at misfit apparitions, Twitter on misfit apparitions and TikTok whenever we figure out how that, that works. Um, of course, the website, the podcast, we're trying to make a good presence and we're very grateful to you for having this interview with us. YouTube channel, that's right. We have a handle uh, at Misfit Apparitions. We just start doing this handle thing on YouTube. But thank you so much for having us. We do appreciate it. We love your podcast. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you guys so much again for be doing this interview with me. And I hope we'll do another one because this was really fun. I hope so, too. We're headed to Malvern after this tomorrow morning. So it's um, it'll be a challenging to uh, go two days without sleep. Yeah, that will be a challenge. How's the temperature? Because I know it's freezing now over um, there. 32, 31, 35. Supposed to feel like, it feels like 28, but it's not that bad. Um, we did, when we arrived here, we ran into a paranormal group that had just spent the night in Malvern. and they just came here. They're um, taking pictures and we ran into them. We introduced ourselves and, and they introduced us and we subscribed to each other's YouTube channel and they wish us the best of luck at Malvern. They said they had a crazy experience there last night. So oh, wow. hopefully there's something for us there tomorrow night. Having that interview being done inside the house was a super cool experience. I hope that you guys all enjoyed it. And a huge thank you to Misfit Apparitions and the team for making this interview possible. Just a reminder that I have their links to their website, YouTube, and all social media handles down below in the show notes, along with the name of their podcast. So please go and give them a follow. And again, I do apologize for the audio only being on one side of the speaker and headphones. I will try to find a different and better way to record an interview in the future. And I am also sad that some of the conversation got a little bit garbled due to lag, but there was nothing we could do about that because of, like I said, the house didn't have Wi-Fi. But overall, I think it turned out pretty well. And I'm going to, like I said, like I'm going to invest in a better software for the future for more interviews. So up until our interview, the activity that the group had inside the home was a little bit, but nothing too crazy. They had had a REM pod going off by itself in their security camera footage and also a small ball that they had sitting on the floor that lights up when it's being touched went off a few times. After we concluded the interview, they went on with their investigation and the next morning Don did text me to let me know what they experienced and they had a pretty interesting night. Later on that night, Crystal and Ernest did the Estes Method. And for those who don't know what the Estes Method is, it's also known as the SB7 Spirit Box Method. This has been a recent trend to use for ghost hunting over the last few years. And if you have watched any recent ghost hunting shows, then you have probably seen this method being used. One person goes into a room or a haunted area, normally alone, and puts on noise canceling headphones that are connected to an SB7 spirit box. Some people also put on a blindfold during this experiment to further isolate themselves. Another person then goes into a different room in the house or far enough away from the person's location within the haunted property. Sometimes they do stay in the same room, but they make sure that the person with the headphones cannot hear them at all. Then the person without the headphones starts to ask questions with hopes that the spirit will answer them through the person that is connected to the spirit box. The person with the headphones on say aloud any words or sentences that they hear from the spirit box to hope that they correlate with what the other person is asking. So basically, the person who has on the headphones becomes a human energy conductor. I hope that makes sense. It's kind of hard to explain, but at the same time, it's really easy to understand if you see it happening in front of you. But now that you know basically what the Estes method is, Crystal and Ernest both experienced activity during this type of investigation. They even had to cut one of the sessions short because while Crystal was doing her session, she heard an angry voice telling them to, well, get the heck out and heck not being a nice word. Some of the crew also had some emotional interactions inside the home. 
So if you would like to know more about their experiences, you can hear about it from their own podcast and YouTube channel when they post their follow-up episode in the coming month or so. I will also let you guys know on my social media handles when they post that episode. So make sure that you guys are following my Instagram page, my Facebook page, and their pages to keep up to date when that episode drops. And thank you so much again to Misfit Apparitions for the interview. I hope that we can do it again sometime soon. The Velisca Axe Murder House has had some interesting paranormal activity, and the house has been investigated by several different paranormal groups, mediums, YouTubers, and ghost hunting TV shows. So there is a lot of eyewitness accounts and so-called evidence caught on camera. I have watched a lot of these videos and shows to prepare for this episode, and I'm not going to give you a breakdown of all of them, but you can find them on YouTube if you would like to watch some for yourself. Many paranormal teams who have spent the night in the house seem to have similar experiences. They have reported the feeling of heaviness as they move up the main stairwell of the house and in certain rooms upstairs. Videos and pictures taken during investigations show possible orbs, mists, and flashes of light in strange shapes, and EVPs have been recorded. This is a strange account that I have never heard of before, but many people report seeing a light fog fill up one of the rooms just after the 2 a.m. train passes through Valinska. This fog then moves from room to room and then all of a sudden disappears. One theory is that the train's whistle might trigger residual events of the night of the murder because many think that the murderer took the train in and then out of town on that fateful night. Other experiences that investigators have had include the sound of disembodied giggling from what sounds like children. The sound of whispering voices or even loud screams have been reported, along with the horrible banging and hacking sounds of an axe hitting the walls have been heard on more than one occasion. Objects move inside the house as well, even the report of falling lanterns as if they have been knocked over by an unseen force. Rocking chairs have also been known to rock on their own and doors slam and open on their own as well. Some people have also reported an evil presence lurking in the attic. One story claims that when an investigator tried to enter the attic, an invisible force kept her from doing so. The house has been owned by several different families since the murders, but they never stayed too long. Some people who used to live in the home reported seeing some pretty scary things. One is a tall shadowy man with an ax standing at the foot of your bed. Another sighting includes images of bloody shoes, sheets, and closet doors that open and close on their own. Sounds of children crying and clothing taking from dressers and closets and spread around the room as if the killer might have picked them up and moved them around. Some have even reported the sound of dripping blood. One family reportedly ran out of the house screaming one night and moved out the very next day. People have also reportedly been scratched by unseen hands. Another common paranormal claim is the sound of disembodied footsteps in empty rooms. Now, what is the reason for all of these hauntings? Well, most people would point to the murder victims. However, while they sometimes do seem to come through on EVPs and during spirit box sessions, the majority of the hauntings seem to be something else. Some paranormal researchers think that the house is a stopping place for other entities that have little or sometimes nothing to do with the actual events that made the house famous. In a video from Amy's Crypt on YouTube, she is investigating the caretaker named Johnny Hauser, and he talked about the house possibly haunting itself. And what he meant by that is the house has so much energy that many spirits come and go throughout the home at completely random times. Something to keep in mind too is that seances have more than likely been done inside the house, especially in the 30s and 40s, 
But people have been known to bring Ouija boards in in modern times. Because of these seances and Ouija board sessions, there's no telling what has come to the house and what has decided to stick around. Another thing that Johnny talked about is that people often feel different moods inside the home. Some have felt deep and sudden sadness out of nowhere, anxiety, frustration, and even anger. Inside Ina and Lena Stillinger's bedroom on the ground floor, it is said that that room has the most mental manipulation. I watched Amy's Cripps video after I had done the interview with Misfit Apparitions, and they discussed that people have been drawn to the home and felt this urge to suddenly visit. Well, I got the chills when I heard Amy also say that she felt like she had too been drawn to the house from a completely different country. I think she lives in Australia. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that's where she lives. But Amy actually said that she had been getting these strange, vivid dreams and a longing to visit the house a whole year before her and her partner actually decided to make plans to investigate the home. And many think that this strange energy from the house might have drawn the killer to the house. Even Crystal from our interview thought that that could have been the case. And I found many others online thinking that that might have been the case as well. It is as if the house calls people to it. Another thing I found out about the house is the vibe in the house is weird and it changes on a dime throughout the home. One minute, one room you walk into feels completely normal and nothing is going on at all. Then you can go outside, regroup, and come back into that same room, and suddenly you feel upset or overcome with emotion. And this same thing happened to Amy. Now, I have watched a lot of her videos. Um, she's done a lot of paranormal investigating in the past, and I kind of think she's more legit out of all the other YouTubers out there, just because she's a lot more chill about it. She doesn't freak out or, you know, kind of ghost adventure it where she's like, bro, what's happening? You know, she's very calm. And if something spooks her, she kind of is like, oh, that was interesting. And then she kind of moves on with her investigation. So I've never seen her actually like break down like this before. But she was actually not even doing the investigation at this point. She was honestly going around moving REM pods and changing out batteries for cameras when out of nowhere, she became so emotional that she had a panic attack and her partner, Jared, who's with her and he's like her backup cameraman and ghost investigator, he actually came in to see what was going on because he heard her crying and he started filming after she was crying. He found her at the base of the stairs crying her eyes out. Then she decided to leave the home because the caretaker had actually told her that if you ever feel overwhelmed with emotion, it's a good idea to step outside to regroup and then come back in later. But as she tried to leave the home, she opened the kitchen door to get out and suddenly a cat came streaking into the house and this made her jump. And like I said, I've never seen her jump like that before. I mean, honestly, if something ran by my leg, I would probably jump too because you would not expect a cat to go running past you. But this cat ran into the house and went up the stairs. And then things got even more creepy because as her and Jared were trying to find the cat to get it out of the home, they heard something like glass that had been moving in the kitchen. And then Amy and her partner Jared both felt like someone was in the house with them. And they began to hear footsteps in the kitchen. They were hearing voices, sounds, and they felt like eyes were on them. It was super creepy. And they also experienced battery drains on their equipment. One of the cameras turning off in the middle of their conversation, plunging them into darkness. And something interesting that happened, they were doing a spirit box session a few hours before the cat incident, and they did get a voice saying animal. So that was super weird. I also found on um, some online forums that the cat, I think it's a neighbor cat, but it likes to come to the house. So people claim that the cat's actually drawn to the house. And I think I've seen the cat on another ghost hunting show once before. But this cat seems to like the house and it seems to be attached to it in some way. And remember, the ancient Egyptians used to think that cats were connected to the underworld and that they would send messages from the dead to us. So that's something to think about. I do think that ancient cultures understood a lot more about connections to the earth and the afterlife than we do today. The house has a lot more paranormal activity. People who have visited the home have left old toys for the children's spirits to play with in the bedrooms where the children were killed. These objects are said to move around the home and have been found in random rooms after the house was locked up for the night. Many paranormal groups use the flashlight technique inside this house, 
and many ghost hunting shows have videos of the flashlights turning on and off on command. The caretaker Johnny Hauser has a very spooky story from the home. He claims that when he first started, he was a complete skeptic, and he used to laugh at the idea of supposed ghost hunters coming to the house. He worked there for a good while and had not experienced anything at all. Until one day when he was upstairs alone and knew that the downstairs doors were locked. He was almost done going through his routine on checking the house when he suddenly heard the distinct sound of a door opening. He was convinced that someone had just broken into the home looking for supposed ghosts. Laughing to himself, he decided to play a prank on them, so he hid in a closet and waited. He heard footsteps enter the kitchen, walk up the stairs, and enter the upstairs bedroom where he was hiding. Then he screamed and flung open the door, waiting to see a reaction, but the room was completely empty and silence rang in his ears. After a stunned silence, he realized that he had just experienced something impossible because he knew what he had heard. This sent chills down his spine. After this, he quickly looked around the home to make sure that he was in fact alone and he left the house a complete skeptic no more. He is now a paranormal investigator, and he has had more interesting experiences inside the house ever since. He now believes that the house is most definitely haunted. Does everyone who entered the home experience something paranormal? Absolutely not. Many people have gone in and come out and said there's nothing in there at all, everyone's making it up, and they remain skeptical, and that's totally fine. Many people will go their whole life and only have one or sometimes no paranormal experiences at all to tell. BuzzFeed's Unsolved Ghost Hunting Show went into the home and they did an investigation. And while they were in there, they got some creepy EVPs. They did get some voices from the spirit box saying things like, stop me, help me, and I'll kill him. And while one of the team members named Ryan was sitting on a bed, it did move and it freaked him out. But for anyone who has watched the ghost hunting show before, one of the guys Ryan wants to believe and then the other guy Shane is a total skeptic, but he's beyond skeptic. He's kind of rude sometimes. Um, I'm not trying to say that I don't like him. I don't know him personally. He could be very nice, but just from what I've watched whenever I watch them do ghost hunting, he doesn't take it seriously at all. And sometimes he even asks like, why am I here? Or like, why am I doing this? And he kind of makes jokes about what they're doing. So I just... I kind of got a vibe from him that he just doesn't want to do it. So I guess he's just doing it for the money. Like, I don't know why he's there if he doesn't want to be there. There's plenty of other jobs he could do. While I have never ghost hunted, um, I've had a lot of paranormal experiences in my life, always when I'm least expecting it. It's never when I'm actively looking for it. Things happen to me at work or when I'm just in my own head doing something important and I'm not even thinking about, you know, anything and I'll have a weird experience. So um, I think sometimes you give what you get and if you're disrespectful and you're rude and you don't want to be there, you're going to bring down the energy and then nothing is going to bother showing itself to you. If Ryan really wants to have a paranormal experience, I think he should go with a more, more positive and maybe even a little more sensitive group. Uh, that also, you know, cares about the historical relevance of whatever building they went into. I think he'd have more luck going with a more caring group than having someone who's constantly cynical. Now, that's just my opinion. Like I said, I do not know them. So I'm not trying to be like, Shane is mean or anything. I'm just saying I think Ryan will have more luck since Ryan obviously wants to have a paranormal experience and Shane really doesn't seem to care. The TV show Destination Fear did an investigation in the house along with an investigation simultaneously going on at Malvern Manor. That's another creepy haunted spot in town and I will be doing a bonus episode on that in the new year. While they were in the home, the team did pick up some weird activity and they also got visited from that cute little cat. The show Kindred Spirits got an EVP answering the question, did you do something to this family? And a voice said, I killed them. They also got some angry voices and Amy and Adam also did a little provoking one night and they got an angry EVP telling them to, well, this is a PG rated show, but basically a rude two syllable word for telling someone to basically mind their own business. You can use your imagination to figure out what exactly that EVP said. And the entities in this house like to use um, colorful language sometimes. Now, the reason that the team went to the house in the first place 
is because an investigator named John Worley had a harsh EVP that he captured saying, kill John Worthy. And it's not surprising that Worley got very upset by hearing that EVP. And after the investigation, many people that he was close to started to suddenly pass away or get into strange and bad accidents. And he began to fear that the house had somehow cursed him and that somehow just because he went to the house, he was causing all this pain for his loved ones. Kindred Spirits has a medium that they use named Chip Coffee, and Chip not only picked up on multiple energies inside the house that feed off of people's emotions and fear, but he also let John know that what happened to his family and friends were not his fault. The entity inside the home just wanted him to think that it was his fault to feed off of his fear and his sadness. The team helped John feel better by letting him know that he is not the cause of what happened, and it made John feel better and like a huge weight got lifted off his shoulders. As you can tell, the house has some dark energy and it really seemed to come out to show itself on November 7th, 2014. The caretaker Johnny said that a man in his 50s and the man's parents came to the house to stay the night and for some reason the man had a large hunting knife with him. The man's parents slept in the barn while the 50 year old entered the home. By morning the man was found laying alone in a pool of his own blood in the downstairs bedroom and he was stabbed in the chest by a self-inflicted knife wound. His parents called 911 and he was rushed to the hospital. The man survived the stabbing and he said that all he could remember was that he was going to the bedroom to try to call out any spirits that were inside the home. Then he woke up in the hospital. He went back to the house a few years later and he apologized to the house for being rude. Johnny does not think that the ghost attacked him, but he does think that the house has a powerful effect on people's mental state. From creepy shadow figures to voices in empty rooms, I think it's safe to say that the Velisca Axe Murder House has many secrets to uncover. Whether it is the family that is seeking justice, the murderer still stalking the halls, or spirits just passing by, the house seems to be a gateway to the paranormal, and it is open for those seeking a glimpse into the other side. Thank you all so much for joining me as we discussed the Velisca Axe Murder House. I hope that you guys enjoyed this episode. I mean, I say that it's a very sad story, so it's not like, I mean, all death is sad, but there's something about when there's kids involved, it just makes it so much more sad to talk about it with an excited tone. But I really did like having the interview element, and I hope that you guys did too. Tomorrow is Christmas Eve, so I hope that everybody has a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And happy Hanukkah, by the way, and also happy winter solstice to my fellow witches. I um, I have been uh, a mess all December, but I am so glad that I finally was able to get this episode out before Christmas. My plan was this was supposed to come out uh, the first week of December, but you know the holidays, man, they're crazy. I just blinked. I felt like Halloween happened and I blinked and it's Christmas Eve tomorrow. It's just wild. Everything just kind of got in the way of my plans and I had no time to actually sit down and record because you know how it is. You've got family stuff. You got cookies to bake. You got movies to watch. All the traditions. Um, I did end up going to the Biltmore one day, which was fun and it was nice to have one day to do something different. I also, like I said at the top of the show, work retail, so I've been working a lot and it was a lot, but I am so glad that Christmas is finally here. To my Patreon members, you'll be getting our bonus episode after Christmas sometime. I feel like I need a few days to myself just to slow my brain down because I am so tired from this whole month, but I promise I'll be back. I also have a new schedule for next year to not get overwhelmed during the holiday season. I have a new plan, I should say, that I'm going to put in place. I'm working on merchandise for the show along with a brand new fancy website. So all that will probably be coming out sometime in January. So please keep an eye on my social media handles for that. I have links to all of that down below in the show notes. I have links to Facebook and Instagram and along with Misfit Apparitions links because again, thank you guys so much for doing that interview. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it sounded okay. And yeah, this episode was hard to get out on the air, but I'm so glad it's done. 
and I hope that you guys enjoy it. I know it's very long, but I'm still thankful that I was able to finish it, and I wish you all a very happy holidays, and I hope to see you guys back here really soon on Historically Haunted. I cannot wait for the new year, and I am just so excited. So yeah, Happy New Year, everybody. I'll see you guys soon. Bye! Bye!